Hello, Pod Smash for the internet, and welcome to another episode of AD with Pod Smash, where gaming goes to grab a beer. We are your hosts, Penguin and Termite. I am Penguin. I am Termite, and we are a weekly video game podcast smashing together ideas that you care about with video games. That's right, and I had Green Day in my head when I was doing that. Oh, is that what that was? So I was trying to sound whiny and emo, but... um. Oh, neat. So if it sounds whiny and emo, then I succeeded, right? Anyways... Not uh... what I got, but okay. <laughs> it is a bad smash. <laughs> Cartman. That's a... uh, there we go. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. But we are... Um going to be talking about Housemark, a developer profile on Housemark tonight. Since we have both been inspired by Returnal and have both been enjoying the game, I platinumed it uh, after a lot of stupidness, but I platinumed it and I, I'm done with it. <laughs> but Yay! it's still so far is one of the highlights of this year for me. So I'm happy to talk about the developer Housemark, though I don't have a lot of experience with them myself. Termite has more. Anyways, we are going to get to talking about that, but we are where gaming goes to grab a beer. So we like to talk about what beers we're drinking First, so what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking Three Floyds Brewing Alpha King Pale Ale. Okay. And I've not had it before. Uh, It's one of the beers I picked up in Maryland when I took a work trip up there. So I'm going to read the can, though. It says, Alpha King is a bold yet balanced American pale ale with a slight sweetness and aggressive citrus hoppiness. And, of course, its ABV is (laughs) 6.66%. Oh, nice. What's it called again? Mm. Sorry. What's the... um... Three Floyds is the brewing. Yeah. company uh a brewer and alpha king alpha is king. the name of the beer thing alpha king it's in a very uh there's like an angry samurai wielding a spear on the front kind of nice. reminds me of ghost of tsushima i don't know why 6.66 has to be you would think they would have named it something devil related but that's fine you would think <laughs> you would know alpha king and it, the taste is exactly what it describes it's kind it says on the can that it's not normal but i'm not picking up anything that's abnormal normal. yeah <laughs> so uh yeah it's good solid pale ale first time i've had it so nice. i like it i am drinking from parkway brewing company i'm drinking mama tired blueberry sour ale Ooh. and the description here is this sour german style wheat beer is packed with copious amounts of blueberries Resulting in a taste as tart as your mama's attitude is your tired mama's attitude. Oh, a fruity treat after a long day of chores. Put your feet up and swig our mama tired blueberry sour ale for a smooth but sassy reward. Ooh, <laughs> it is. It is very tart. It's almost as tart as the sour monkey. It may even be more tart than the sour monkey, but um, it's a beautiful like purplish blueberry looking hue and. I wouldn't have thought it was made with actual blueberries when I tasted it earlier, but now that I see it in the glass, I I see that like as I, you know, the debris that it leaves, the residue it leaves on the side of the glass would make me think that it actually has blueberries in it. Huh. So it is, yeah, it's good. It's sweet. It's tart. And, but I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't necessarily be able to like specifically point out that they were blueberries is that's that's contributing to the fruity. You know what I mean? It it just kind of tastes like a general berry sour. Interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily. And maybe that's my inexperience. I'm no expert, so that's maybe my inexperienced um, taste buds there. But I like it. It's good. I would. I'm glad I have a six pack of it because I would drink it again. Did you like blueberry pop tarts as a kid? I liked them well enough. I didn't. My favorite was the. Um, well, my favorite favorite was the s'mores. Oh but, yeah, uh, those are awesome. But the brown sugar cinnamon was kind of the standard favorite yep. of mine. But um, I would eat the blueberry and the strawberry one. I think if I had to choose any of the fruit ones, though, then probably blueberry over strawberry. For sure. Hmm. I was a cherry kid. Ew. What is <laughs> Specifically the cherry, like the pink frosting, not the strawberry. Yeah. Uh-huh. I remember every, the one like, you're talking about. Strawberry is like everywhere. Everyone had yeah, strawberry pop yeah, tarts. I was like, get that fine. out of here. I want the cherry. That <laughs> I was remember like, the oh, cherry with the pink so frosting. Good. I remember mm. feeling like it. T- I remember thinking it tasted like Pepto Bismol. Wow. What kind of childhood did you have? A uh, childhood that <laughs> I can't even <laughs> say that. I can't even say that I ate good food because here I am being like a snob about pop tarts. So <laughs> we were both raised poor, poor Southern folk, and we yep. have we have uh, very heated opinions about. Pop tarts, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right. Well, that's enough about pop tarts. What is going on? You, we, I've not talked to you in like two weeks, other than just chat and messages. So, how yeah. is how are things? Well, I went to Florida for two weeks, uh, down to Pensacola, which is where they make Mecha Godzilla. In case you haven't watched Kong versus Godzilla yet, 
And I did not find Mecha Godzilla in Florida, but Aww. I did find a lot of humidity. And all of the Florida Man stories that you read about are true. <laughs> I have man. lots, lots of stories to tell. Um, some of which are not kid friendly, so I will, you know, table those. Uh, oh, I just remember one that was really hilarious. <laughs> so I've, yeah, I have lots to catch up on with all of that. But I will talk about one one of the cool things I did attend my first con convention. Uh, I went to Pensacon. It was the Saturday I had off work, and I was completely free that day. So I decided to grab a forty five dollar ticket. And to my disappointment, there wasn't a lot of video game related stuff. Uh, apparently, there's a separate convention that happens there at a different time of year that is more focused on gaming. But there were celebrities, there was a vendor floor, there were comic books everywhere, and lots of cosplay. So as I was wandering around trying to get my $45 worth of an experience, I was flipping through the little pamphlet they hand you, and I noticed that Judith Hogue the actress that plays April O'Neil in the original right. 1990 mm-hmm. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie was there. Of all of the celebrities that were there, that was the one that stood out to me the most. Uh, there was a lot of celebrities, and people would be like, really, Danny, that's the celebrity <laughs> that stood out? Because who played Meredith in The Office? I forget her name. But she was also there. In fact, I saw her a lot because of where she was in relation to where I was trying to be. I kept getting turned around, and I kept walking in front of her table. So uh, that was kind of wild. There, there was a bunch of celebrities there, but I committed to Judith Hogue and it's a thing that celebrities charge money for like selfies or art- autographs. And I forgot about that until I saw it. And I was like, Oh yeah. And, and they should like rightfully so it's their time. They deserve to sell, you know, themselves. So I was like, crap, I don't have any cash. So I like wandered around. It was a lot of walking. I had, like 20,000 steps that day. It was insane, but I got in line to see Judith Hogue and behind me in line stepped a, an amazing shredder cosplayer. And I have pictures of all this stuff. Uh, and I do plan to share them on social media, maybe around the time that this episode goes live so I can, you know, show it off with the, that episode. You guys have visuals to go with it. And sure enough, I, I step up to uh, to meet Judith Hogue. And she is super, super awesome. Uh, nice. Very approachable, very, very nice, and was very talkative. We talked briefly about how uh, I have – she asked if I had any kids. And I was like, yeah, I have a five-year-old. And, like, do I plan to introduce them to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? And she said, now, she was 22 years old in Hollywood when she was in that movie. Yeah. And so very, very masculine, dominated, patriarchal society in Hollywood in the 80s. And she was very young and very pretty. So at the time, I don't, someone, like, approached her, was like, do you even know or how dare you or do you care about one of those three ways, which is never a good way to start a question, <laughs> uh, how you are starring in a movie that glorifies violence for children? And at the time, 22 years old, she doesn't have any kids. She's like, nah, it's fine. Like, parents going to do what they got to do. Like, whatever. I'm making money. Like, she seemed like very non caring about it. But now she has her own children. And what's, I don't remember the ages or names. I don't think she gave all that information. But she's got children now. And was kind of like, huh, yeah, that's kind of a thing. And all of that was around, like, am I going to introduce my five-year-old to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and the kind of pause that I had uh, as a kid? I was introduced to it at a very young age. I was definitely, like, five years old getting Ninja Turtles stuff for my birthday. And so would I do the same to my children? Why not? I don't know. It was an interesting conversation. But we were wrapping up, and she was super, super cool. And I had to ask her one last question. And I was like, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. I'm not, like trying to get into anything here, but why weren't you in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2? Because she was recast. Uh, uh-huh. April O'Neil was cast by someone else. And she kind of chuckled, and she's like, because I spoke up against how they treated a stunt double, and they didn't like it. Oh, wow. And what it was, and she went actually went into a longer conversation than I had thought. I felt bad for the people in line. So she's like, the way it was was this. They bring in men from China to do stunt stunts like to do all of the karate and like flipping and stuff and someone got injured badly and in china when you get if you're from china and you get injured on set they send you back to china in america if you're an american stunt man you just go to an american hospital and then you come back so this chinaman that's i mean her words i don't know if it's is that a racist term i'm not trying to be like uh, uh, sh- uh yeah that no, should be fine I, yeah like her words, china, quoting, right yeah uh-huh. yeah Came over, got injured really, really badly, and was shipped off. And Judith Hogue didn't like how it was treated. Like, they, because from her perspective, they just shipped him off. Like, bye, you got injured, you're out of here. And she thought that was very unfair. So she spoke up against it. And because 22 year old woman in Hollywood in the 80s, they don't like it. 
So she got canned and not looked at for the next movie. And I was like, wow. Yeah. So that's, that's the culture back then. It was a fascinating story. It was a great interaction. I also have a picture with her and yeah, she was one of my first like celebrity crushes as a kid. So she called me Mikey was me like (laughs) on the TV. Like, you know, I love it. Awesome. Um, well, so yeah, it was I'm kind glad of you can have that experience. My banter. Yeah, that's Pentacon. awesome. Yeah. It was a good time. Cool. Yeah, not much happened. Not much happened on this side of the world. I'm so. on the same side. I was just in Central Time for two weeks. Well, okay, right. Well, this side of the hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> up the coast? And... I'm, yeah, up the coast. There you go. Nothing happened that much up 95. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been, a, I mean, there's been a lot of like news and stuff that's happening. So we cover we cover all that in our, our news show. Um so it's just been exciting to see all the all the things talked about, but otherwise fairly uneventful. So did you see my son because... got a sandbox? My dad Ooh. my dad came and brought a sandbox that he built that has like a cover that like folds out into a like a little like a bench. Whoa! So you can like okay. sit on the bench while you play with the sandbox or whatever. So it's um, fancy. Yeah, it's real cool. So we played with that today for Memorial Day, and um, it was fun. So nice. Ooh, and we put my kid on Dramamine for the first time. We'll to take Ooh. a car ride up for Memorial Day. Yeah. And like it didn't make him noticeable. I mean, so he did sleep, but it was like his nap time anyways. OK, but he only and he only slept for like 20 minutes. He doesn't normally sleep in the Ooh. car anymore. Yeah. So like but he didn't seem that out of it in in any like before his before he fell asleep or after where he woke up like he wasn't any more out of it than he normally is. So but it did keep him from puking. So that was nice. <laughs> hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, that's that's definitely a plus. Yeah, for sure. So, yep. Other than that, got nothing else going on. Is there anything else okay. you wanted to mention? Yeah. Did you see the Skyward Sword Amiibo? We didn't cover it on our new oh, show. Oh, you're probably right. Won't. Yeah. But, and that's why I want to bring it up here. But sure. There's yeah, a. No, I awesome... saw that was total BS. Complete yeah. and total BS. The way they're handling that. There's this really amazing looking Zelda Loftwing Amiibo, and if you don't know what a Loftwing is, it's the bird that's on the Hylian crest. Big old bird. Uh, and it, it, they're both characters in Skyward Sword, of course. And there's a new amiibo, right? Get excited. Like, yes, finally, a new Zelda amiibo I can throw into my collection because I have them all because of Justin. We say it every time. The Bokoblin amiibo, thank you, Justin. You've helped me complete the set. So I had to get it. Like, I'm chopping at the bit just to get a pre-order. And I missed it because I was stuck in labs at work in Florida. And I could not get out to my phone because my phone's in the car. So I got lucky at lunch and I had pre-ordered one. And I had no idea what was going on with this amiibo and why it was even a controversy. So why are you bummed? Why is it crap? Oh, yeah. So they added a feature. So they like to do things where if you scan the amiibo, you get some kind of in-game benefit or in-game reward. And usually it's as simple as just like items or something like that. With the Zelda Loftwing amiibo for Skyward Sword, they're basically giving you a teleport back to the base or whatever, the the loft, uh, air, a sky loft or whatever it's called, mm-hmm. and you can use that mid-dungeon and then return back to the point you were in the dungeon. So it's a feature that people were clamoring for since Skyward Sword was released originally on the Wii, and now it's uh, now it's been included in the remaster but only for people who have this stinking amiibo so it's a pay to win kind of thing i mean it's not a competitive game so it's not technically pay to win but it's like pay to or or not just pay it's not just like oh download this dlc that would be one thing but no it's get your hands on an already limited hard to get amiibo item and and only then can you have access to a feature that arguably should be included in the base game anyways ridiculous Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah, it's pretty pretty not a great look for Nintendo, but not also at all. also par for the course for Nintendo in a lot of ways. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, not into it. Hmm. Yeah, and so like I'd I'd seen the the feature and I got all excited about it and I was like, oh, that's kind of a bummer for those who couldn't get one. Right. It's well, it's you know, it's and I don't blame you for collect. You you wanted the you were going to pre order this amiibo anyways. You were going to get your hands I did on that it. Ex- exactly that. I did that right. Like I exactly. pre ordered it and got it done before I even looked into what it was doing or what exactly. it was. Exactly. You had yeah. no interest and in, and 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 you know I I have no problem with your purchasing of the amiibo and and scrambling for a pre order. You weren't doing it for the wrong reasons. You were doing it yeah. for exactly the reasons why amiibos exist for enthusiasts and collectors. Yep. They shouldn't have features like that. <laughs> <laughs> that are tied to something that's already hard to get item. Yep. So whatever. So I wonder if they will rectify this at all, if they will allow any other Zelda amiibo, like the more common ones, to unlock the same feature. Like I, there's how many Link amiibos? Like there's right, a million right. of them and like a couple of Zelda ones. But I hope, hopefully that's what they'll do. They'll just kind of patch it to make it 
more or accessible. Just include it in the base game. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> just make it for yeah. everybody because why not? It's uh, yeah. You're already asking people to buy a game that's you know almost a decade old. Like you might you might as well sweeten the pot um, yep. with some cool features. But whatever, quality of life features. But whatever. Cool. All right. Well, Nintendo locking features behind a paywall is not our favorite thing, but doing this podcast is our favorite thing. Doing this podcast is our favorite thing. Favorite things. It's a segment of our show where we share with you something that has inspired us this week that we are excited about, that we are digging in hopes that you might be inspired to go out and find your next favorite thing. So what is your favorite thing, Termite? On a side note, this is the show which we stole that song from, Master of oh, None, yeah. uh-huh. season three is now on Netflix. <gasps> it's out? Just, yeah. Came out on the 23rd. Ooh, burr, burr, like, burr. <laughs> yeah. It came out last weekend and I was in Florida and I told my wife, it's like, you better not watch it. I'm going to be mad. Nice. And well, now so I have we something. It. My wife and I are working our way through a couple shows right now, but now I have something to add to our list. So yeah, awesome. it's 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 heavy. Right oh, off is the bat, it heavy? Ooh. It's heavy. Ooh. So get it's ready. It's supposed to be a comedy. <laughs> it is. There's there's comedy in there, but Good. it's heavy. Good. Yep. So my favorite thing is today is Memorial Day. It's the day we're recording this episode, and it's also my son's sixth birthday. So I have a six year old now. Oh my gosh. Which is insane. I can't right? even. We're, he just yep. graduated from kindergarten, going into first grade. And we celebrated his sixth birthday today. Uh, it's also kind of the biggest post-COVID sort of celebration thing, as most of us are all vaccinated. I know my direct family is, and some of our extended family is. And so we were able to get together. We went to a park. We rented a pavilion, and we had everybody show up. And it was Super Mario Brothers themed, so yes. I was in my element. My wife made this amazing cake, which... I also will have to share on social media. So when you edit this episode, remind me to share Shredder, Judith Hogue, and the Mario cake because there's Word. lots of visuals to go with all of this. Yeah. And uh, it, he got a bunch of, of gifts like Mario Legos. and But his biggest gift and my actual favorite thing was giving him this was we went shopping for a legit big boy bicycle. Ooh, uh, nice. It's like the step up from the toddler bikes, but not quite a gear bike. If you call them that, I don't know if that's a thing, but so it's a 20 inch like youth bike and he still wants training wheels. So we got him training wheels and I went for a bike ride with him. We were also gifted an adult bike by family. And so I haven't had an adult bike my entire adult life. So I jumped on to my bike and was like, let's go for a ride together. And it was just a quick cause it was super cold and kind of rainy when we went shopping for this. And we went for a little bit of a bike ride, and it was like, hey, I'm riding bikes with my son, who's wow. six, almost. At the time, he wasn't quite six yet, but yeah. So my favorite thing is his birthday and the bicycle that we got for him, and he's not as excited about it as I thought he would be. Uh, he's more into other things, like his Legos and like creative toys and stuff mm-hmm. that we got, but yeah, so that's that's my favorite thing. Awesome. I had a kind yeah. of, I had a moment like that where I was, where I was just, literally I was throwing a ball with my son. And I was like, oh, my gosh, we're playing catch. Like, right. Like, this uh, is this is dad stuff. Right. Like, I mean, it. he's two, so he can't catch the ball, nor can he particularly throw it very well. But still, we were just what in the hallway. Kid. And I was just, right. Yeah. Oh, gosh. But we were just in the hall, just like throwing the ball. He'd run after it and then throw it at me. It was awesome. It was great. Yay. Was like, it's just, it's, yeah. you know, when you're a dad, you think of all the things you're going to be doing with your kid and like riding bikes and throwing and playing catch are like the like <laughs> default dad things that you're yep. expected to do. So that's yeah. awesome that you had had that with him my favorite thing is we uh again memorial day weekend it was also my mother-in-law's birthday so we went up to visit her brother so it's my uh, uncle-in-law i guess i don't know how that works family wise yep. but it was my wife's uncle we went up to his house they live in uh fairfax just outside of dc and whenever we go up there almost all uh, almost every time we get catered lunch they get a catered lunch from a place called moby dick and it's a chain kebab restaurant so i I only recently learned it was a chain the food is so good that i'm like it might as well be a local it's it's better than most of the mom and pop kebab places that we've tried to find as a replacement down here oh man Uh, it's really really good so anytime we get kebab from uh the, the specific thing we get there is called kubi day and it's awesome it's so good so it comes with a big thing it comes with rice comes with non bread comes with this like yogurt sauce that is just like oh my gosh so uh, my favorite thing is moby dick if you're ever up in the I, I, I they're probably all over the place all over the country so you know depending on where you live you may have access to one but if you live in virginia and don't know where the nearest moby dick is there's definitely a couple up in fairfax actually uh wow. so it's um 
yeah, it's it's good. So we had leftovers oh. today too, and I was like, oh, I love kebab. I love Iranian food. It's so yes. so good. So we'll have to go get some Moby Dick sometime with you. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah, and stop stuff. by Aslan and get some beer. Oh, get some beer from Ashland. Mm. So, all right. Well, that is favorite things, which leads us to our last segment before our main topic, which is <laughs> DLC. DLC is downloadable content, and it is our last segment of our show where we try to have just a fun mini discussion, something that uh, kind of primes the pump and gets us thinking and chatting, and it's usually more lighthearted and fun. And sometimes it has something to do with our main topic. Sometimes it doesn't. And I like to call it a conversation you wouldn't normally have about video games. So I know that Housemark is known for more than just Returnal. But I would like to talk about Returnal. So I wanted to talk about it in the aspect of the fact that it's a roguelike game. Roguelite game, I should say. Mm-hmm. And so for our DLC today, my prompt is taking riffing off the idea of roguelites. Roguelites almost always... When they have a story, they almost always have to justify the idea of the time loop. Where Why is the character caught in a time loop? Why does the character start back at the beginning every time they die and can't escape the time loop? So they have to come up with some kind of justification for the time loop and a reason to escape a time loop. So, Or, or like a method by which to escape the time loop. It's all, for the most part, inspired heavily off of the movie Groundhog's Day where Bill Murray's character gets stuck in a time loop on Groundhog's Day and has to find love to get out, I think. So that is There's like a pro- million Christmas movies that do the same thing. Do they? <laughs> yeah, I love them. I'm yeah. trash for them. <laughs> this is, have you seen the show, Na- the movie Naked? No. Oh, I think, I forget who it had. It was one of those like, really like, um, like it was like a Netflix movie. And it was basically the same thing, except the premise was he wakes up each time in the loop, he wakes up naked, completely naked. And, <laughs> So anyways, anyway, so we're going to riff all this idea of time loop. So the DLC today is you're stuck in a time, you wake up and you find yourself stuck in a time loop. How do you break the time loop? What do you like? What do you, what are your first attempts to break the time loop? What do you do? What is, what is your go-to? You've been raised by, by roguelike video games. You've been raised by time loop movies. So you, you know, the general ideas is how to break this time loop. What, what do you do to break the time loop? Or what do you try you, to do? You have to establish the pattern. You have to figure out. Sure, sure. Yeah, what's which, your pattern? So like, what day you do you live get stuck a in? day and then you wake up and you realize pretty early on in the day that the exact same things are going to happen. And I'm immediately going to know I'm in a time loop, which yep. is different from movies and stuff because most of the time people don't know they're going to be in, in a time loop. But uh-huh. you and I are different because we have consumed media with time loops. <laughs> so we will know immediately that we're actually in a time loop. And I would be extremely excited at first. Be like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what am I going to learn here? What do I got to do? So what is, probably what is the lesson I have to learn. <laughs> yeah, it's it's always a lesson you have to learn. That's how it works. Uh, and so I would want to learn the pattern. Like what change what what can I change? So I would probably just live a couple of days in exploration and like really mess with things, try something crazy different before I land in the middle. It's like you'll go from one extreme to the other and then kind of narrow that down as you approach the middle ground to figure out what the game is Mm -hmm. what in the world do you have to do so what i hope is not the case is that there's something entirely random like i need to get on a plane and go to this specific lat long coordinates and like place this item in this spot and then i'll break the time loop but if there's no way to know that that's completely unfair that's not how this works right so i hope not (laughs) <laughs> you get stuck. You get stuck in a time loop the day before E three starts, and you're not planning to go to E three. But the time loop only breaks when you go to E three. <laughs> oh, that would be a great movie. Like some, right? Some like you realize like, you have oh. to go to E three. You're driven. You have to be there. You have to see this, like this one game get announced. Like that's where the loop always ends and starts. You you see the announcement of the game, and for whatever reason. Uh, you get stuck in a time loop because you have to be there when that game gets announced. And if you fail to do that, you you have to start the loop over again. That would be a fun movie. That'd be so a to, like, lot of fun. Frantically buy tickets and figure out, and then like shenanigans. Oh, oh happen? Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be a good one. That would like be a that. lot of fun to watch. I would be there for that. <laughs> I'm thinking like the Grandma's Boy vibe, which I know you haven't seen the movie yet. Yeah. Oh, that would be. Hilarious. You talk about that a lot. This is like the like fourth or fifth time you've mentioned that movie. So I feel like we need to have a viewing party. You need to yes. come over and we watch. Please Grandma's do Boy. whenever um, you want. <laughs> the do you by the way as a side note as a tidbit do you do you have you ever heard like how many times there's a bunch of different like ideas as to how long bill murray's character was stuck in the time loop in groundhog's day 
and they're ridiculous. The script says something like 10,000 years, I think, because... Oh, my the, gosh. Well, because the script was, like, riffing off of... There's this idea that it takes 10,000 years in Buddhist philosophy, I think it is. It takes 10,000 years to purify the soul or something okay. like that uh, once you've reached enlightenment or whatever. So they're riffing off that. I don't think it actually was, but there were... If you look at the basic numbers, there was something like... I think they did, like, 40 total loops in the movie. Like, if you're just going by the number of loops in the movie... Yeah. It's something like 40-something... 40, 40, 40 I want to say like 40 to 60 loops, but if, but other people have done different, like have looked at it a different way and they were like, okay, so at at a certain point he has learned how to like play the piano and talk different languages. And so they were like, how long would it take to, they did the math. It's like, how long would it take to master this language and master playing the piano to the point where you could like play the songs he did. And they found, they did the numbers. It was something like, it was several, it was like several decades. It was like, I think 30 years or something like that. that they they figured it out. So it's like, nuts that's that's the other aspect of time loops you uh-huh. know you're stuck in this alternate non-consequential reality and you can uh-huh. do whatever you want and right you're so always he kills wake himself up tomorrow. like a million times yeah it's, it's one of the parts of groundhog's day is he where the like the, the there's a whole montage of time like different ways he kills himself and he but still then wakes, wakes up, up so wakes up the next yeah. morning yep exactly but imagine like removing yourself from all responsibilities of everything in the world and you can mm-hmm. just do whatever you want every day right because there's no consequences right yeah. mm-hmm. oh that's nuts right so but also different languages eventually you yeah eventually you um you gotta you drive back. you insane yeah yeah mm-hmm. yep yep for real i don't know I, I like i thought of this question right before i basically asked it and i was like man what 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 would my go-to what would my go-to thing like be i guess the I would, most i think i would start by just being really nice to my wife assuming that it was some you know <laughs> love deity that was like trying to teach me how to be a better husband or something like oh crap what are all my shortcomings as a husband let me try to figure those out real quick <laughs> and, Nailed it, and then you're still in the loop and i'm still in the loop crap what, what is going on yeah you go through all the list of things okay am i dealing with like a love deity am i dealing with a trickster deity like what's going on <laughs> <laughs> the most important question is does my ps and profiles count persist nope. between no nope. resets every day <laughs> so then i don't have to worry about my platinum trophy collection no, you just at all. play as many games as you can you play any... i wouldn't at that point i'd probably just cast aside video games altogether and just right. focus all of my loops on other things so yeah. then when my life gets back together and trophies matter again i can get back to it yeah you like the only thing is you keep in each loop is the knowledge you learned from the previous loops like, yeah and yep. that's that you don't keep anything else do you age loop. nope you don't age yes either. at least oh, in, this at is least amazing in, dude i'm gonna in... be a I'm going to be an incredible everything. I'm going to learn all the instruments and just do all the sports and like all the athletics and be incredible. You don't yeah. keep your, you don't keep your physical progress though. So, oh, well that's, dumb. so you don't get stronger. You don't get, you don't like, you just have knowledge. You, you may, you probably don't even keep your muscle memory. You literally just have knowledge mm. is the only thing that carries over for each mm. of the knowledge and memory um, and whatever wear and tear on your sanity. <laughs> yeah. I guess there's that. Progresses. Yeah. yeah. That's fun. That's a fun conversation. That's it a fun is. conversation to have that may even have nothing to do with video games. So, yeah, cool. Awesome. Well, then uh, we want to hear what your thoughts are. You're stuck in a time loop. What do you do to get out of it? What are your go to? What kinds of things do you do while you're in it? And then more importantly, what kinds of things do you try to get out of it, whether they are successful or not? So uh, we want to hear those thoughts and more. Termite, where can the good pod smashers share their DLC thoughts with us? You can find us at 80bitpodsmash.com, 80bitpodsmash.com. That's our landing website where we have links to all of our podcast platforms as well as our social media outlets. Our social media outlets are Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Discord, as well as Reddit. We have subreddit. I may have said that twice. So you can create your own threads. You can go into our Discord server. You can interact with us live. But you can also jump over to twitch.tv slash 80bitpodsmash where we go live twice a week on Monday nights and Wednesday nights. Monday nights for our new show. Wednesday nights for our gameplay live stream. You can find us in all of those locations to interact with us, ask us questions, give us your comments, thoughts, concerns, and ideas. We'd love to have them, have you and them with our conversation in our community. Add to the mix. It would be great. So hit us up, like, and subscribe, hit the bell, you know, all those cool YouTuber things. All right. Awesome. I love how, by the way, just as as a complete side note to the discussion we just had, I love how like you took what would be many people's worst nightmare of having to live the same day over and over again. You're like, yes, I want that. I want that happen to me right now. I want to learn all the things. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, yeah, You you may be the one person that would not be driven crazy by that. I mean, I was very excited about the COVID lockdowns for a longer, lo- a lot longer than a lot of people were. <laughs> That's true. So there's yeah. that. 
That's fair. <laughs> Maybe it's just a testament to how busy I am all the time. Yeah, and I just yeah. need to stop, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, you need a break. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. You need a break that's not just a planned break. Like, not a vacation where you then have to go do a bunch. What you need is to take at least, like, a, like a long weekend or something of vacation time and do nothing with it. Other than just yeah. hang out with your family and play games, watch movies, and not... You know, have you like have a, that. a beach trip, not like go on a beach trip where you have a bunch of things planned every day and there's all the stresses right. of being with, you know, you know, there, there can be great things about a beach trip with a family, but also there can be a lot of stressful things about going to the beach with your family. Yeah, you need something not that. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I'm with you. I agree. So, all right, cool. Well, then tonight we are talking about House Mark Entertainment. We are doing a deep dive, which has a fairly um, rigorous structure to it. Not rigorous, but just, you know, we have we have the same questions with each of these. So, uh, yeah, House Market Entertainment, they are known most recently for Returnal, but they have a pretty lucrative career based on what I can see doing games back as early as 1993, if you if you want to consider the formation of what well, we'll talk about their history. But spoiler alert, they were actually two studios that merged into one and they are a Finnish video game developer based in Helsinki, which is the capital of Finland. I one of my favorite bands comes from Finland. That's why I'm familiar with them. So, and who's um, that? Nightwish, brev. Ah, yeah, love me some. You've told me about them before. I ah, love me some Nightwish. <laughs> so, yeah. Although that band has a complicated past too. They've had more lead singers than they can probably afford to have had over their career. Anyways, so yeah, House Mark. We'll start at the beginning though. We always start uh, with the basics. So, who are they? What are they known for? What's their history? I'm not trying to be a jerk or an over like grammar Nazi. Sure, but. Housemark is just Housemark. There's no entertainment at the end. Oh, my bad. <laughs> That's fine. I was like, crap, actually, what did I say wrong? What no, did I do did. wrong? Yep. <laughs> I'm totally overhyping that, overemphasizing it. They're actually like Housemark Oi, like O Y. Yeah. And I don't know how to pronounce that, but it's even on their main website. Their mm-hmm. name is Housemark Oi Inc. Interesting. Incorporated. Yep. So wow. anyway, what, what was the first question? <laughs> what's their, what are the, what, the basics? Who are they? What are they known for? And what's their history? We kind of have gone oh, yeah, over you, you told, yeah they, they were founded in yeah, officially nin- in 1995 uh july 19th actually which it may be or may not be uh t-bone's birthday yeah. um not the year he was born but the day right and he would have been i don't i can't do math uh, right now yeah, but anyway man. that's when they were founded so they were founded in the 90s they were making a bunch of games for like amiga and atari and there are a bunch of stuff i've never heard of and then they also made um the Super Stardust for the MS DOS in '96, and the reason why I highlight that is because they made Stardust in '93 on the Amiga and Atari. And the reason why I mention that is because one of the first games that actually made them creep up into my life was Super Stardust HD on the PlayStation 3 back in 2007. Nice. So I didn't actually play it. I just I heard about it, heard a lot about it. I heard it was yeah. really good. They're kind of mm-hmm. unique in the developers we talked about so far, in the sense that they were actually two independent studios that uh were founded the same year again they were the they were the two first video game studios in finland they were founded the same year and they you know were releasing titles in parallel to one another until they worked closely together um uh, the, the, or their creators worked pro- closely together and ended up merging the two companies so the original companies were bloodhouse and terramark um, mm-hmm. which is where the name house smart comes from <laughs> yeah and they Blood were uh, terra Terra yeah, blood. right. Terra, you're right. Instead of yeah, House Mark sounds much better than Terra yeah, Blood. Does. Yep, <laughs> so, or Blood Terra. <laughs> so yeah, so the both of those studios were founded in 1993. Mm-hmm. Terra Mark was founded by Ilari Kuitinen and Stavros Fasulas, and then T- Bloodhouse was farmed by Harry Tikanen. Tikanen, and again Tikanen and Kuitinen uh, were working closely together in 95 or in 94 and then they did formally merge their companies into house mark in 95 so it's kind of an that's an interesting history we haven't really had any developers that we've covered yet that have that you know kind of history where we've had ones that were merged into other bigger you know um what was it people can fly the last one we did they were like started as their own thing then they merged into epic and then and then they broke away again which is also a fairly unique story but um we haven't had ones that were like completely independent parallel studios that formed at the same time and then merged together to form a bigger studio. So I just wanted to highlight that yeah. uh, part of their history. Huh. One of the things that, of course, we always cite Wikipedia because it's like the wealth of knowledge that puts this stuff together and it's sure. cited. And Elf Mania was a game made by Terramark in 1994. Mm-hmm. It was released. It's a fighting game. And so I just did a quick like YouTube search and just watching that you can see 
the fluidity in a game from the 90s it seems more there's there's more detailed animations in like street fighter it seems like it'd be a little wow. bit it's a little faster paced even i can see why it was mixed reviews like it doesn't look nearly as good as street fighter but it still had like that same kind of fast paced smooth motion that you would get from a house mark game mm-hmm. especially in like the more modern stuff like Resogun and returnal so yep. uh yeah i just you see cool the origins even, of it there yeah yeah uh-huh. you can like go back and it's obvious not a lot of studios are like that. When you go back and look at some of their origin stuff, you don't see that through line, but mm-hmm. they are very consistent. So that's good. Yeah. And it's crazy to see how many different like publishers they've worked with. And, you know, um, and they, they self published a couple of games too. It looks like Next Machina and Furman's were both self published games. And then, you know, they've worked with Activision, Sony, Take Two, Ubisoft. So they've kind of been, uh, they've, they've, they, they definitely, you know, they're described here as, you know, they started freelancing more or less, and they seem to have be a pretty independent entity, uh, not tying themselves directly to any major publisher up to this point. However, however, uh, after Returnal's uh, reception, I think that uh, Sony would be remiss to not try to acquire them at least. <laughs> yeah. So at this point, but we'll get, we'll get there. We got lots to cover before there. So, so was there any controversy in their merge? Other than they just like they work together and it was like no, oh. it, it looks pretty. It looks pretty. Um, at least I can't tell from from any of this if, if there was any drama. Uh, they are the oldest active video game developer in Finland, which is a kind of cool achievement for them. I don't really know many other <laughs> developers out of Finland, but uh, doesn't mean they don't exist. So nice. But um, yeah, no, it seems pretty pretty chill. Uh, it, let's see, let's see. In November 2017, the company announced that it would be stepping away from the arcade genre, which had. In- you know, been most of its games up to that point, as it was not generating enough revenue to justify further development of the genre. Oh, we'll get there. <laughs> right, yeah. And they eventually put all of its, uh, eventually put all of its in-development projects, including Storm Divers on Halt in January 2020, and said focused, uh, shifted its focus on a project the company considered to be its most ambitious of all time, which we know was eventually Returnal. So, <laughs> and yep. it sounds like that was a good, it sounds like that was an ultimately uh, good decision to shift a lot of its development away from um, well, to shift it away from Battle Royale, which is what Storm Divers was, and um, oh, they totally wow! I just looked it up. I didn't. I remember vaguely remember the game being announced. Uh huh. If you look it up, you can definitely tell that's Returnal. That they use the same assets. What Storm like, Divers engine? Yeah. Oh, interesting. It's third person over the shoulder. It looks exactly like the same camera angle. Some of the UI elements look very similar. Wow. I'm so yeah. glad it didn't come out as a Battle Royale game. Like that's amazing <laughs> wow. that they pivoted. That's into... uncanny. That yeah, they pivoted into um, interesting. All right, well, I'll have to look that up later, then. But um, cool. Well, can we move on from the basics and talk about? Absolutely. Well, let's get personal. What's your favorite house mark game? Oh man, that's hard to say. Yeah, you got more history with them than I do. So <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, through the PlayStation Three era is kind of where I jumped on to them. Actually, my first experience with them is PS Four on Resogun, which was super fun. Mm-hmm. But having their the knowledge of who they are, I went like went back and played. Super Stardust HD and Dead Dead Nation. I want to say Dead Nation, but for some reason I'm losing confidence that that's the, actually what it's called. So I'm going to look mm-hmm. it up. Right. Yeah. Dead Nation. Yep. Uh, I did not play Alienation or Next Machina, though I'm dying to. So my favorite Housemark game is probably Super Stardust HD. Ridiculously fun. So all of those games that I just mentioned are very, very arcadey. And that's when, like, it's funny that they left the arcade market in 2017 because it wasn't lucrative, but it's all point points focused and multiplier based. If you get hit, you lose your multiplier. So your multiplier gets your, your score up and there's power ups that help you. And it's just like in crazy, insane bullet hell, very fast paced, but also ridiculously smooth, like high quality arcade fun. It's the same fun you would experience like in 2017 or in 2010 with dead nation or in 2007 that you would have experienced in the eighties or even late seventies going to an arcade uh, but you having that experience at home and it's addicting. You just want to play again. It's always in like little chunks that you can just keep doing. And you're like, Oh, just one more time, just one more time. And now you can see that in Returnal and I'm loving Returnal way more than I thought I would, despite the struggles that I'm having with it because it has that same feel. It's that very fast paced, extraordinarily smooth, like high quality polished action game where you are jumping through bullet hell, dodging and bullet hell is just a word that we use in the industry. It's like, whenever the screen is filled with a bunch of dots that you have Littered to maneuver, with, yep. maneuver around. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, and a lot of other genre, like games, like the shmups, the shoot-em-ups, like use mm-hmm. the same thing. So it's yeah, kind yeah. of a cross Bullet Hell is kind of, of an old, yeah, it's an old, 
like an old um i mean i think of contra when i think of bullet hell like pretty mm-hmm. much and it was kind of some of the origins of that genre i know there are other we never really covered bullet hell because it's it's as much like a descriptor of genres right. as it is like yeah. a genre in and of itself. Um, the genre uh, closest to that would be shmup, the shoot 'em up genre. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Shmup genre. Yep, yeah. exactly. And but yeah, well, it's funny though because as much as they like clearly were were putting aside arcade, like there are many people who have commented on the fact that like Returnal is, for all intents and purposes, an arcade game as well. Like, and roguelikes in general are have their roots in arcade <laughs> and mm-hmm. so um the arcade influence still lives on in a lot of ways in returnal it even does. if it's not yeah. even if it's not a traditional arcade game which is great yep. it's great to see kind of that the dna that makes arcade games fun is still something that can thrive in a triple a environment um in 2021 so mm-hmm. anyways uh, if you haven't picked up on the fact that i don't have a lot of experience with any with any of the how smart games so i am a uh, i am a big I'm a big Returnal fan. That's going to be my answer. It's Returnal. <laughs> <laughs> and we might have to to break that of you and do some couch co-op Dead Nation. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah that's fine because Dead Nation is uh, yeah, Dead Nation one that has my eye. I also a lot of fun. saw Next Machina yeah. and I'll talk about that later. But Next Machina looks really interesting to me as well. Yeah. Um, I did end up looking up the um, the Storm Divers gameplay. Yeah. You're, you're right in the sense that it's like there are the like there's DNA of it there, but oh my gosh, that game looks so generic. It looks like such a generic battle royale game. Um, yeah, it does. Yet it's got that like it's got the same jetpack that yep. uh, Returnal does. Very interesting. Did it's you watch not the trailer nearly... or just I watch both? I watch both the trailer yeah. and the gameplay. Yep. It's not nearly as it's not nearly as fast paced as Returnal is. Right. I was imagining like f- the pace of Returnal in a battle royale game, which is a battle royale game that would interest me like uh, ah. like can you imagine like that speed and that yeah, precision um yeah. in a battle royale game would be mm-hmm. fascinating i get my butt kicked constantly but you know <laughs> say lovey so <laughs> nice all right what do you think housemark has done to bring innovation to the industry well we kind of touched on it like mm-hmm. they really took the idea of taking the the fun of a coin based arcade shoot 'em up and they've married it to an online arena especially in in the later like playstation 3 on where everything you did was connected to online so super stardust hd had the simplest version of that which is like leaderboards but then dead nation came out and it was kind of this how many zombies did you kill in your country and like collectively did you rid the nation of the zombie you know pandemic or whatever so that that was super fun so they, they took those ideas and kind of connected them to the larger base but they also brought that that feel forward they took something out of the late 70s and 80s and brought it to modern games and they're still doing it like we talked about even with returnal mm-hmm. and so to me that's what housemark does like they are quality game studio the con to that you know those are all pros the con to that is in a world in, a, in a, our industry is really really favoring big or two things we have games as a service like Destiny and De- Division, yep. et cetera, and the Avengers and such, where everyone's trying to get into that market. And then we have like triple A story experiences like Ghost of Tsushima, Last of Us Part Two, and you know, Final Fantasy VII Remake, like big adventure games or RPGs that tell stories. So where Housemark doesn't fit is it either one of those categories. No. It's not an, a games as a service by any means, but it's also not a super story based heavy. Although Returnal is their Returnal first is their toe first kind of yeah dip in the toe, yeah. but then, and that's what's interesting is like yeah they've to riff off that that's kind of in a lot of ways my answer to the question or answer to the question is like they've been they really been doing their own thing and and it would be hard for me up till this point to distinguish them from an indie studio because of the types of games they put out you know what I mean mm-hmm. like like the, the 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 look and feel and uniqueness of their games up to this point have very much been indie and that's not a criticism of them that is a they've clearly been okay doing their own thing but with returnal what they've done is they've said oh we have the chops we clearly have the chops to quote compete at this level at this triple a space yeah and yet not compromise our vision for what games should be the fact that you know because you, you talked about it, you said that the two types of games that they or that that make money these days are these big blockbuster adventure story driven games and you know games as a service and it's funny that like storm divers would have been them chasing after the latter would have been chasing right. them after the games as a service you know microtransactions print money and the fact they stepped away from that in order to ma- try their hand instead at a big budget blockbuster story game while simultaneously then also saying but we're going to make the game we want to make and we're going to bring the roguelike genre into into the triple a space in a way that hasn't been done yet is really kind of impressive so i think you know they clearly are uh, are a studio that 
does doesn't compromise their vision and makes the games they want to make. Yep. While still also again, they brought a whole new genre, a genre that for the most part has been locked away in the indie space. They brought it into the AAA space for the first time successfully. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, they they are unique for sure, and mm-hmm. like it's really really cool to see what through line they have with all of their games including the scoring and the multiplier and like getting hit resets you because even in returnal with the adrenaline system you build up your adrenaline to level five but the moment you get hit goes back to zero Uh and like Uh the idea is to keep that multiplier or in this case the adrenaline level as high as possible for the best rewards yeah and 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 so it rewards it rewards careful gameplay which in a bullet hell is exactly what you should be motivating you know you should be motivating correct placement you know uh, c- correct placement and and uh, evasive abilities and knowledge of the enemy types and stuff like that because if you know what types of projectiles they shoot or what their attack patterns are then you're going to be able to avoid them and place yourself correctly and um so yes having that multiplier to to um Roy, you actually have drifted into our next question which is what I did are the kinds of things that house mark includes in several of their games and you know what again we're talking about those kind of small nitty-gritty details what are things that you're like oh clearly this is a house mark game because of this and to me, when I was watching footage of uh, some of their games, I didn't see it as much in Resogun. But then I watched a trail. I watched some gameplay of Nex Machina, which is a game that came back out in 2017, I think. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like a top-down twin-stick shooter. Almost looks like an isometric perspective, like Diablo. And I saw the red rings. I saw the it- <laughs> those dang red rings that you have to jump over in Returnal. I was like, oh, that's it. That's my answer to that question because that's totally uh that's uh, clearly a house mark thing is those red rings yeah another house mark staple is particles they are all yeah. about particles yeah. everywhere particles all over the place resogun yeah i'm looking at next machina gameplay right now uh dead nation with like blood and physics yeah definitely uh the bullet hell shmup part of twin stick shooter is Stardust HD, Dead Nation, Alien Nation, and Next Machina are all twin stick shooters. So like all of that makes sense. It's kind of their sh- their stick until Returnal had come out, but they really broke away from the whole twin stick shooter idea. But they still brought some of that DNA forward. Like there's mm-hmm, totally. Returnal is not a twin stick shooter, but if you know and you played twin stick shooters for years, you could you can feel that. Like you know, this is one step away from being a twin stick shooter. Yeah, twin stick yeah. shooters are not I mean, honestly, twin stick shooter the difference between a twin stick shooter and a third person shooter is literally just camera perspective. Like, I yeah. mean, you're still you're still, you know, moving with one with one joystick and shooting with another aiming with another. It's right. just you have, you know, more dimensions to work with in third person, whereas in a twin stick you're just top down. But it's mm-hmm. the same the same principles effectively apply. You need to both move and aim at the same time. It's just the the difficulty then comes in adjusting to the um the perspective. And the nice yep. thing about twin stick is that you you can see the whole screen. Um, that was a big complaint early on with people were having with uh, the difficulty of people were having a hard time adjusting to the fact that yeah something something could drop you know behind you and you had to react to it without being able to see it sometimes. Yeah. And that that you know fans I think of House Mark's other games may have had a hard time adjusting to that immediately. Yep. And another through line of all their stuff that's unique to them is the upgrade system. There's always upgrade your weapons, add on power ups uh, all the way through to, you know, all of the twin stick shooters have various weapons and it's always something like a rock, paper, scissors kind of thing. It's like this situation is really good for this weapon and this so on and so forth. And I noticed it the most in Resogun, Dead Nation and Stardust HD it was like in Stardust HD, there were specific types of asteroids that would be circling around the planet. You're trying to, defend and you had to use specific types of weapons but you could upgrade each three of those weapon types separately and so all these power-ups are flying there's particles everywhere it's twin stick shooter you're trying to dodge and focus on not dying but also maximizing your damage output by using the correct weapons for the correct situations and that I'm watching this next Machina trailer and I can see it all right here too <laughs> exactly I was thing. watching a uh, dead nation gameplay and I'm like Man, I want I, you're right. We should 100% we should stream that because yeah. I don't know which, what um platform you have it on, but that looks PS4. like I was going to say that looks like a great stream because we're it's you know it's top down. It's it looks it, it looks like a great couch co-op game is what I'm saying. I was like, oh, "Yeah, looks fun. it is." Well, I mean, I know it's fun single player. I'm sure it's fun couch co-op. It's already more it, fun so. couch co-op. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Great. And we'll slot it on the calendar at some point. So, yeah. Um, awesome. Any other thoughts on that or do we want to talk about our last question here? Let's go on. Let's move on. All right, what do you want to see more or less of from Housemark in the future? 
I want to see another Returnal type game that's not a roguelite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, with, I'm with you on that. I can get I can get behind that. I would love to yeah. see that speed qual that speed and quality of gameplay and type of gameplay, but something something without the roguelike elements because those are fun. They're awesome. They're great. But it would be awesome to do that with like a, with a um like a co op third person shooter something like something I, I I'm thinking in the vein of like Gears of War or something where we can play together and shoot things shoot them up things together but just like with that same quality of the engine whatever mm-hmm. engine they made that with they need to make another game with it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or maybe something yeah. co op it, it'd be fun to have like the the same bullet hell like experience with that you get from Returnal where it's just stuff everywhere you got to jump and dodge and mm-hmm. you know whisk melee in your face distance range a, a whole like yeah all that would be super super fun i would love to to play something like that it's not mm-hmm. a roguelite that involves you dying over again <laughs> although that does i did skip a point going back to our previous question about what makes them unique uh another or at least what is a calling card of of housemark is the difficulty yeah. my gosh like mm-hmm. their games are all so hard it's like yeah. they start off they the difficulty curve is exponential it starts off fine you can get through the first stuff and then it just goes <laughs> and it's like, but then it even, well, at least with the returnal, it evens out after a certain point. Like I could yeah. probably, uh, I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but like I've learned the game. Well, you know, it just, just like a, just like a, like a souls, like once you kind of learn it and have done it, like it's not, it doesn't seem as intimidating anymore. Yeah. And like, I'm pretty confident that I could like do a run through of the whole game with minimal deaths at this point in a few hours. Ooh. But I, I don't necessarily want to like, again, that's not to my own or it's, it's a matter of like the game teaches you how to play it. And eventually uh, you pretty much you pretty much eventually you learn it, um, at least my experience with Returnal. I don't know how it's true for all their other games, but you're right about that, that difficulty. I mean, they they definitely they're not as high profile as from software, but if they make more games of the difficulty level and quality of Returnal, they could definitely be seen as a from, from software, you know, analog in regards to just being being known for high quality, high difficulty games. Um, yep. So that'd be great. I uh, I'm with you. I would. I mean, I would love to see what I would love to see from them is uh, I, I hinted at it at the beginning of the episode, but I would love to see them picked up by picked up by Sony as an official as an official PlayStation studio. The reason is because I would love to see you know Sony. Sony usually tends to pick up the best of the best, right? And we just talked about how Sony needs some risk taking, some studios taking risks, and and I mean they clearly took a risk with with Housemark on Returnal and it paid off. So I'd love to see that you know, continue to be invested in by Sony. And, and yeah, I think that Sony putting some of their resources towards Housemark's creativity, you know, combine that with Housemark's creativity, I think we'd see a lot of great games. I'd love to see a Returnal 2. I just have no idea how they would, what that story would be based on the ending of Returnal. Not to spoil anything, but it's not a, Ooh. it's not a game that has an easy like, oh, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're back on Atropos, guys. Let's, like, I'd have to follow someone else or something, I think. Ooh, Which spoilers be, abound. All right. I mean, it, well, just the nature of the time loop, right? Like, once you break the time, as we, as we hinted at, once you break the time loop, that implies certain things. And I'm not going to necessarily, I mean, obviously, I've kind of hinted at things, but it may not be the, it may not be exactly what you think. One way or another, it's not an easy game to just, like, narratively pivot into. But I suppose they could just follow another astronaut getting trapped on Atropos. Yeah, why not? And, and... You know, of course, intrigue abounds there. That would that would be interesting in and of itself. So, mm-hmm. ah, so good. <laughs> it is good. Yeah, I like. I'm, I'm a big. I'm a Housemark fan now. It's oftentimes what happens with these developer profiles is I have like one or two experiences with them, and then I'm like, wow, and I really, really want to go back and play more of their games. So, like, you know, we've covered Insomniac, we've covered uh, a Naughty Dog, and each of those times that we covered them, I was like, yeah, I have played one of their games. And then I go back and, and now I can say like, yeah, I've played a lot of Naughty Dog. <laughs> I've played a lot of Insomniac at this point. I just platinum Ratchet and Clank too. And I'm planning on getting ripped apart as well as the Spider-Man games. That's oh, great. Like it's fun to then, you know, it's fun to kind of be inspired by the work we do here. So yeah. Anyways, final closing thoughts. Anything else you'd like to see from House Mark in the future? Or can we wrap this, uh, wrap this up, tie it with a bow and call that a podcast? <laughs> there is a side scrolling platformer game from House Mark called Matterfall that looks like Returnal, but it's a platformer. And I just discovered it for the first time right now, but it came out in 2017 on the PlayStation 4, and I'm looking at a trailer for it. Oh my gosh, it, it looks does look like Returnal. really, really fun. Mm-hmm. Oh man, it came out in August of 2017. Mixed or and... average reviews, though. So, mm, yes. Oh yeah? Huh. So that's my last thought. Matterfall. 
let us know what you think about it. Have you played it? What do you think of Housemark? What do you do yeah. with your games? Are they hard enough for you? <laughs> have you played any? If you haven't played any, then are you interested in playing them? Or have you heard this podcast and you're like, nope, no thanks, I'm good. <laughs> so, anyways, yep, let us let us know those thoughts and more. Termite, I know you just ran through where they can find us, but give us the Cliff Notes version. Cliff Notes, 80bitpodsmash.com, landing website, podcast platform, social media outlets. Make sure you find us on twitch.tv slash 80bitpodsmash and look for our Discord link in all of our show notes. Jump into our community, interact with us, ask us questions, heckle us, poke fun at us, leave us a review if you uh, love our show. Please go and find whatever platform you of your choice and leave us a review there. That would be super helpful in getting our show discovered by more folks. And if you are on YouTube or Twitch, make sure you subscribe to us so you can be aware of our coming video. Huzzah! We don't have an episode slotted for next week. So hopefully we will be able to come up with something before next week and we will talk to you, talk, whatever it is, it'll be great. We'll see you then. See you next week! <laughs>